Hi, everyone. The technical difficulties. Uh, let's see. Actually, it looks like. Hmm. Looks like my computer is still. Uh, okay. I think it's lagging. Let me refresh. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, okay, well, I think, I think we're live now, right? <laughs> I think so. Okay, maybe you should keep track of the Twitch instead of me, because my computer is, like, having problems. But okay. anyway, um, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, my name is Amy Claire Fontaine, and um, Dr. Eric Kirschenbaum is with us today, too, and we are both... Um, zoologists, but also uh, writers. Uh, I write uh, free fiction and uh, Eric writes nonfiction. And um, we're just interested in talking about how to craft um, animal-like uh, fantasy creatures today. Um, I know that um, different different stories have different um, have different goals and so um, not everyone will want to do like extensive research into the the species of the animals that they're um, that they're writing about but um, just thought it might be fun to talk from a zoological perspective about how to craft um, creatures in your fiction that are similar to real animals so um, I'll let Eric introduce himself. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Eric Kirschenbaumer, and so we're both zoologists, and I'm at the University of Cambridge. And Amy and I have worked for years, so we work on wolves. Um, so we've been tracking wolves and observing wolves and listening to wolves. And we spend a lot of time with wolves and watching them and, and looking to see what they do. And it's just like, you know, for us, it's easy. We understand that there's really interesting stuff that animals do, and, and it'd be great when that stuff goes into fiction and it comes out in fiction. So I'm really, I'm uh, really excited about um, about all of this. Just a quick plug because Amy did mention my book, uh, Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, so I wrote this is a non-fiction book, but it's about how we can use study of animals to, on Earth, like to understand what aliens are like and what fantastical creatures must be like, and it's all the things that all kinds of life have in common. Um, and that's that's one of the things that's really important if you're going to find out if you if you want to write unreal animals that behave like real animals. I guess I forgot to mention my books. <laughs> um, I have a book called uh, Beyond Acacia Ridge from Goal Publications, which is about um, anthropomorphic hyenas, and I studied them in Kenya uh, for a while, and um, I wanted to write a book about hyenas that was kind of different than the Lion King that would maybe portray them in a more positive light and uh, incorporate some aspects of their behavior, which I found really fascinating. And um, and I've got a, a fantasy novel from uh, Thurston Howe Publications as well, I think they have a dealer's den <laughs> at this convention. And, um, and most recently I published a, a game with a uh, choice of games called uh, Fox Spirit, a failed adventure. Uh, in which you get to um, play as a fox and run around, and I have fun putting actual aspects of fox behavior into that. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're writing about animals. So, um, yeah, different people have different different purposes for using um, furry characters. Um, it can be used. They can be used for more of like an aesthetic or symbolic purpose, or just because it's because it's more fun <laughs> when different things are going on when it's anthropomorphic animals instead of uh, humans. But um, but if you're interested in incorporating aspects of animal behavior into your uh, furry characters, um, there are some different um, categories uh, you can consider. Um, sensory perception is one. So um, 
how we as humans think about the world is so grounded in um, in our own way of uh, perceiving it. We tend to rely mostly on um, on visual cues, which is why where the word like image and imagination comes from. And even when we talk about imagery and fiction, that's reflecting our, our bias towards visual stimuli. But um, but animals have a lot of different ways of uh, perceiving the world through um, their amazing sense of smell or hearing. Um, they can hear uh, different frequencies than we can. Um, some of them can see different colors than we can. And um, considering how um, how animals uh, perceive the world could be reflected in the kinds of uh, imagery that you use to describe things that are going on. Um, let's see, uh, cognition is another thing to consider because different animals. Um, have evolved in different ways and so they have different ways of you know thinking and um, have different problem solving skills depending on um, the context in which um, in which they developed and so for example like there's a bird called the Clark's nutcracker that's able to store um, thousands of seeds and find them again <laughs> And their um, their spatial memory is very excellent because they evolved to um, to remember where they stored all these seeds for the winter, and so um, so they've proven to be good at uh, problem solving skills that involve spatial memory, and um, and things like that might be useful when you're making uh, furry characters because um, for example, if you're writing about a character who's an intergalactic explorer or something, um, uh, an animal that's more of a generalist species, like uh, like raccoons that evolved to like find a lot of different uh, food types and things like that, um, might uh, be better at solving uh, novel problems than an animal who's more of a, a specialist and more focused on, you know, just like a panda who's just trying to find bamboo or something um, so um, so different things about um, their communication and um, cognition are things that you can consider when uh, creating animal characters but um, it's it's important to consider that um, with things like communication um, a lot of furry writers do this really well um, in terms of adding like um, dog-like behavior to their uh, canid characters, like ears and tail positions and um, like whining, growling, things like that, because uh, because dogs are very familiar to us. And so um, a lot of readers would uh, easily recognize those kinds of, of uh, signals, but um, but if you want to create characters that are um, grounded in uh, real animals, it can be important to consider that sometimes the um, the behaviors that they use that look to us like human behaviors actually mean something different to the animals. So, like um, grinning is a sign of uh, you know happiness in humans, but in other animals, it can be a sign of um, aggression or fear, and so um, so those are things that might be um, interesting to consider. Um, ah, I'm really nervous. I have a support hyena here. I'm sorry. I feel like I was going to say things, and anyway, I'll let Eric talk now. <laughs> No, that's okay. No, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with 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 um, with with what Amy's with with what Amy's saying. Of course, because you have many different reasons to to write about animals. You may want to write about write animal characters, furry characters, because they really break the reality. Okay, they they give you an alienation. You want to discuss a difficult topic. It's easier to discuss it with two headed ducks than with than with humans. So if you don't want to make them realistic, that's fine. But 
animals are also really interesting in themselves and they're really appealing. Everyone likes animals. So, so if you want to do animal characters that have that sort of natural appeal that people, that, that people are familiar with anyway, they've got to have some realism to them. They've, 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 got, to, so they've got to have those associations that, that we have. The thing is that animals, so portraying animals realistically, really, really, really difficult because we, it, it's hard to get into their head. Yeah, so there's a, there's a philosopher called Thomas Nagel who wrote a really famous essay called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And, and he said, no matter how much you understand how the bat sees the world, how the bat uses its sonar to, to fly around in the dark and things like that, you will never understand what it's like to be a bat. You'll never get the batness out of it. The best you can hope for is like a human representation of a bat. And that's probably true, but it actually helps when you're writing fiction, right? Because you don't want to portray a bat really like a bat is, because if you do, none of your readers would be able to, to, to relate to it. It'd be like, eh, what's this? This is like, I don't understand what this thing is. So all of these animals in fiction all have some um, animal characteristics and some human characteristics, so at least we can relate to them a little bit, which is fine. My favorite example of all of this, this is my favorite example of all of this, right? Wash it down. I don't know if you've got this, um, uh, the mirror image, but uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant furry novel. And it's, it, it, it has animals doing, they've got animals with human needs, right? And human relationships and human dialogue, but they're doing animal things. They're behaving like rabbits actually, actually do. And it's, a believable combination of that of the, the animal and the humanness. How did Richard Adams write such a brilliant book? When I was doing my undergraduate degree, I was a young zoologist, and I was rereading my childhood favorite novel, War Ship Down, and I saw there was an, an acknowledgement to, to uh, he said he was inspired by this book called The Private Life of the Rabbit by Ron Lockley. And I, this was before the internet, right? So it was not, didn't have book finder and things. So it took me a long time to track down this book. And I finally found it. Okay, here it is. The Private Life of the Rabbit is written by a naturalist. It's, it's nonfiction, but it's written as, as if it were fiction. It's th this guy, he, he, um, he built these, these large enclosures and took wild rabbits and put them in them and then just sat there and watched them uh, for months and for years and recorded the behavior of these animals and it, it, it's fantastic. I mean, it just reads like, it, it reads like a story, you know, as I read a little bit here. So like uh, old bachelor Timothy was almost certainly born in 1953, possibly earlier. He was easily driven forth from the tree hide shelter by the arrival of Columbus, who came to protect young Desiree, who was responsible for digging new quarters there. Poor old Timothy had never been a success. It was surprising he managed to go on living for we would find that old displaced bucks died swiftly, but he was alive and skulking about in the passage tunnels, now in plain, now in wood. I mean, it's like, it's like reading a story, but it's naturalist observations. Not all of you are as lucky as Amy and I that we get the chance to go out and actually like sit for hours and hours and hours and, and watch animals. It's not necessary to understand how they behave and how they live, because you have these people who've done it for you. You've had, you had people like, like Ron Lockley, who's a fantastic naturalist, and a bunch of other people. I mean, another one that I really love is Jack London, right? White Fang, I'm not so keen on Call of the Wild, but White Fang is a superb sort of point of view of the animal naturalist story, but it's written as a narrative with a real fictional, it's, it's a fictional story, and it's not observations like, like with the rabbits, but it's written as a as a, a naturalist would would see it um the other great the other the guy i love is is ernest thompson seaton his, his books are a little bit harder to find his most famous book um, wild animals i've known also the animals are portrayed as fictional characters but it's a naturalist writing and he's describing all of these all of these behaviors and and and, and the characters of the animals as characters it's easy to see them as as furry characters that you could that you could put in 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 fiction so the, there's some the great um familiar sort of fiction like um 
books that that that, that are that are purely descriptive uh, that are stories, but they're also ones that are that are much more descriptive. I've just finished this one um, by Rick McIntyre, a friend of Amy's, who worked with us in uh, in Yellowstone National Park, uh, The Reign of Wolf Twenty One. It's really it, it's his. It, he's he's almost like written up all of his notes. But when you go into the story and you see, you can feel the characters, you can feel what these animals are doing, what they're thinking, how they're behaving. These are the things that, that really give you a picture into the, 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 the lives of these animals. The other one I want to mention actually is Jane Goodall's, uh, Jane Goodall's book, so uh, Through a Window. Fantastic view on the, on the way that, the, the, that a society of chimpanzees live and move around and, and interact with each other. So use the naturalists. Use these writers. They're not. It's not scientific writing. It's for the general public, and it really, it really helps. Um, I had like three things that I thought are really useful to if you're going to write if you're going to write realistic animal stories. First, you've really got to consider the environment, okay? Because all animals grew up, evolved, and and live in a particular environment, and you don't have to place them in that environment, right? You're not going to find jackals walking around New York City. It's not going to happen. But if you understand where a jackal lives, right, and how it lives, and how it gets along on the African plains, then you will, you will see those elements of its character and its personality that would fit in in New York City. And you can transpose those by understanding the environment in which, in which they live, right? And, it, and it's... And it's not all that different in, in, in many ways, yeah? You just have to see those, those similarities in the environment. Second thing you have to pay attention to are the, the, the animal's traits. So when I say traits, I don't mean so much appearance. I don't mean things like, oh, they've got nice like red fur or, 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 or big shiny eyes or something like that. When we talk about traits, we mean characteristics that are adaptive. They, they, they do a job, they fill a role. They've evolved for a particular reason. And because they've evolved for a reason, you can easily transfer them from one environment to another, right? So if you're a jackal on the, on the plains of Africa and, and you've got to be cunning and you've got to be wary and you live your life right, stealing other people's food and, and, and sneaking in when, when, when there's a carcass somewhere and you, want to, and you want to get a bit of food, and these are adaptive traits. This is why the jackal lives the way it does. And because they do a job, they'll do the same job in another environment. Okay. This is the this is the this is concept called convergence, and this is something that I that I um, talk about a lot in my book um, about how because these traits are common, that they're solving common problems like finding food and avoiding becoming someone else's food. They're transferable from one species to another, from one environment to another, from one planet to another, right? So, so all of these kinds of traits that, that a particular animal uses can be used in other places. Birds fly, bats fly, bees fly. Why? It's just really useful to fly. Okay, they they, they need that they need that ability if they want to if they want to get around. So. So pay attention to, to the traits that you have. Are you like are you like some sort of grazing herbivore? Okay, you've got food everywhere. You don't need to worry about finding food. Your main concern is not becoming someone else's food. If you're an ambush predator, then every part of your life is about being stealthy. Everything you do is about moving quietly. You know, and and that doesn't just apply to the jungles where you live, it can apply to the Bronx or wherever your, your, uh, your, your story is set. The last thing, which is really important, is to think about an animal's social behavior. Sociality is absolutely key, right? All animals are social. They have to be, at least they have to mate. So they have to come in contact with, with other animals. And animal sociality is like really, far more complex than, than simple sort of human, human sociality that we're familiar with. And it's what really, really gives them their character, okay? That's what makes Watership Down so successful, is that Richard Adams took the, the observations of rabbits' social behavior, how they interact with each other, and incorporated that into his novel. And now the rabbits sound like they are real rabbits because they're interacting with each other in a way 
that real rabbits interact with each other. It's not easy to put yourself in, in, in the mind of an animal that, is, that has a completely different social behavior to yours. Now, imagine you're a male polar bear, right? You spend almost the entire year wandering through the snow all on your own. Mating maybe you know, once a year, but, but that kind of lonely existence. Or you can, there are some animals, particularly social insects, whose lives are, whose social lives are so completely unfathomable to us, it becomes much harder. Can you imagine, like, there, there are ants who will blow themselves up at the entrance to their nest if there are intruders coming, you know, something that it's really tough to put your mind into. And of course, this is what Nagel was saying, this is what he's saying, you, you can't really put your, yourself in, in, into their head. But as best as you can do that, that really will give the characters real uniqueness and, 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 and real believability. So I, I think animal fiction is fantastic. I, I, I love it. And, and, it's, and it's when you can get inside the mind of the animal a little bit, and even a little bit, portray some of that, some of, some of those ideas. I think that, that, that makes it much, much richer. But i uh, hand back to Amy. Well, yeah, I guess I'd also add that, I mean, in order to get people to sympathize with uh, your your animals as characters, uh, some level of anthropomorphism is always, well, I mean, it's inevitable, but it's also useful because it'll help people, um, people empathize um, a lot more. And so even if you're, um, you're trying to get into the animal's head and their perspective, like they'll generally at least uh, talk and uh, think in, in human-like ways. And, um, and also as you're doing your research, if there are aspects of, um, there, there are usually aspects of their life cycle that all humans can relate to as well, like um, animals uh, growing up, leaving home, um, losing loved ones, like everybody can relate to Bambi losing his mom, right? Um, so um, so different things like that um, can help um, to bring out um, empathy and sympathy for your characters, um, even if they're not human. Um, so I don't know if we've been getting um, questions in the chat yet, or if we should start ferrying, bantering back and forth with each other. Yeah, a couple. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll um, pick them up as they as they come up. But but yeah, we can we we can find it back and forth. But I had the question that I wanted to to ask you because I really liked Beyond the Cation Ridge. I think it was it was fantastic. Anyone who hasn't read it Thanks. yet, you know, go out and buy it. And Thanks, it's a, <laughs> so it's a, it's a it's a great story that that blends animal behavior and human emotions. Okay, so that. That works really well together because, because I mean, a lot of literature is, is about human emotions, and it, and it's neat to see that tie in with the animal with the animal behavior. What the thing that I was wondering is, you think you could do that the other way around? Can you write a story that has animal emotions but with human behavior? Is that is that ridiculous? Why why is it so easy to do human human emotions with animal behavior and, and perhaps harder the other way around? Well, I think it's easier because as humans, we just kind of naturally have a tendency to anthropomorphize and to project our own emotions and experiences onto the things we see. Like that even comes with people naming their cars or inanimate objects, things like that, or, or kids talking to their stuffed animals. Like we have a tendency to project our, um, our idea of reality onto other things. And, um, and I guess that can kind of be what literature is about sometimes is, um, you know, exploring the human experience and things like that. And so I think it's just easier for us because obviously we're inside our own heads. And so we can protect our emotions and our experiences onto animals. But um, since we can't be those animals, we can't, it's, it's harder to do the other way around. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I agree. So we've got some, we do have some questions. Um, so uh, Kaizak says, what are your thoughts on anthropomorphic characters who are hybrids of multiple animal species? Ooh, that's actually really interesting. Um, I, um, 
I feel like um, Beastar is my favorite comic. <laughs> Explored this in some really interesting ways because they had a um, a villain who was um, a hybrid between a, a cheetah and a gazelle, which obviously is not something that can happen <laughs> in zoological reality. But um, but with the way uh, with the world building she did, it, it just made the character really interesting um, from a societal perspective and from the way they could from the way they perceived the world um mm. that's interesting because because it's like it's almost as if that hybrid is was deliberately chosen to be ridiculous you know you like the half of you wants to eat the other half of you or something or something like that um so yeah kind of seem to be two kinds of hybrids right there's a hybrid that that seems ridiculous in that sense uh, but there are also hybrids which are simply hybrids of traits which could sit well together in a single animal, but just don't, right? So you can, for instance, um, I know you said, well, you, people have made, you know, luminous luminous rabbits or, or whatever by taking genes from, from luminous jellyfish and placing them in, in, in other animals. And so that's not something that occurs in nature, but you could certainly certainly have it, you could certainly imagine having having that. I didn't know they did that with rabbits. That's cool. Oh, I only knew about the goldfish. Rabbits, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then you have, so I suppose the, the big, the best hybrid that the, sort of the one that really springs to mind is, is some kind of predator with wings, right? Like a, a, a winged wolf. What would you think of that? <laughs> winged wolves. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I know they can't exist, but I love them. <laughs> Aren't they? I mean, okay. Can they exist? Can they exist? They haven't existed, but does that mean they can't? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if we've answered your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't think of, so I, I'm just trying to think of, of, of I mean, one, you could think of evolutionary reasons why they might not evolve, but but I can't think of any really good reason why a winged wolf, a flying wolf, shouldn't exist. Scientific. Oh, really? I mean, you there's... just my day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, you could you could you could think of all sorts of hard sci-fi sort of uh, objections, like like oh well, birds have have got you know hollow bones to make them lighter so they can fly, and I don't really see how you could do this, and at the same time take down a bison. Um, but that, that, that's small details. That's that. I, I think I'll let that one slide. I'll, I'll go with the winged, the, the the flying wolf. I'll have one of those. Cool. Me too. <laughs> also got a question. Any tip on how to think or put yourself in the mindset of another species? That's from Good Friend. Hmm. Well, let's see. I guess. I mean. Ideally, it would be cool if it's a creature that you're able to just watch, like in nature or at the zoo, to kind of get a sense of how they um, how they are in the world and how they behave. But um, but short of that, um, watching videos, reading books, uh, like Eric mentioned, it seems like a lot of uh, naturalist writings are um, especially useful because they provide. Um, less of a like technical scientific perspective and kind of more of an ep empathetic and uh, literary perspective. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, as I said, I just finished reading, reading the, the Reign of Wolf 21 and, and I mean, I cried at the end, but that's mm. not that surprising, but, but um, you, you just, enter into the mindset by reading you really do it's just like the de the daily description of how they're playing with the with the pups and and how they 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 interact with other wolves and and, and with their prey uh, the details are actually quite mundane so basically they do the same thing every day right you know, this is like four years of, of, of four year story where nothing happens it barely happens but you really, you really enter into the mindset of the animals just by just by reading observations of their of their daily activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess I guess like we were saying, it's um, it's easier to observe behavior from the outside than it is for us to put ourselves into the mind of an animal. So I guess um, being able to um, 
do some research in addition to the, the behavioral side of things and like examine more of the, the internal workings of why they do what they do uh, from what zoologists have discovered is um, useful also. So you can make sense of both the, the form and the function of what's going on, <laughs> like what they're doing and why they're doing it and where that perspective comes from. Yeah, and that ties into a question from uh, Z Shadow Fox, which is how would you go about creating an entirely new fantasy species, not based on an existing animal? And and Amy's kind of giving you the answer to that. You don't need to base it on an existing animal. You need to base it on an existing niche. You need to base it on an existing role. What is the animal doing? Once you know like how it lives and how it interacts with its with its ecosystem then all of those traits, all of those abilities sort of build up on, on, on top of that. Now, of course, you have to draw on, on, on existing animals to some extent. And there's nothing wrong with that because, like I said, there's convergence. So the same solutions keep cropping up again and again because there aren't a million solutions to, to, you know, to every problem. There's really only one way to fly in an atmosphere like Earth's atmosphere, and that's with wings. There's, you know, you can have a... You can have a dirigible sort of um, uh, lighter than air uh, solution, um, but you know those are it. Those are the two solutions. So, so you can use existing animals to get to understand what the solutions to the problems are without actually making it literally a hybrid between between those animals. So, I, I think that's 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 kind of a, a cool way to go about it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's just like something you talk about in your book about convergence and how different um, different animals can evolve separately, like e on other continents or even on other planets, but still perform the same functions in nature, like how, um, how thylacines evolved in uh, Australia uh, independently of, of wolves, but they fulfill a, sim a similar role in the, in the ecosystem. Um, so understanding, um, I guess from an ecological perspective, like what's out there in the environment um, to be uh, to be exploited, and then working from there to think, well, what kinds of animals will evolve to take advantage of this this source of energy or this kind of thing, and how will they move, and how will they um, how will they gather food and things like that. So I guess um, I guess uh, the world building is helpful too if you're creating a new animal. Understanding what kind of world it lives in will help you figure out um, how it works and how it lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything you think this is from Wolfen seventy seven? Is there anything you think authors don't think about enough when they create animal characters, either physically or mentally? What do you, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, no, first. I'm still scanning for, for more questions. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, different stories have different, um, different levels of um, adherence to reality and like there's no right or wrong way of, of doing things, I guess. I guess now and then I notice something in a furry story that just um, kind of makes me curious more than anything, not like objectionable, but like um, if two, um, I don't know, canid characters or something are walking around in the in the dark with, with flashlights, it just makes me wonder like, oh, how, like, why, why is that happening? Because don't they have eyes that are developed enough to be able to see in the dark or... Just, just little things like that sometimes just make me wonder, like, how is it that, like, in in their appearance they look like an animal, but but they're behaving or perceiving things in a different way? But I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I just um, just coming from a perspective in zoology, sometimes I'm like, oh, hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's, there's a balance, right? Because you because you have to. You have to, to, to balance the, the the fact that you want your animals to appeal animal to look animal like and appealing like animals, but you also need the reader to relate to them, so they have to have some human characteristics, and and it's just where where you you draw the line. Sometimes you so 
So the, I think the answer, my answer to the question would be it's the social behavior, right? I think that, that very often stories push the social behavior much closer to the human social behavior than to the, the kind of social behavior you'd really expect from those animals. And that's fine because I can see that, that if it were too animal-like, then, then maybe you wouldn't be able to relate to it. But, uh, but I always like to, to, to see stories where the animals are interacting with each other, um, you know, like, like animals. Um, actually, I had, a, I, I had a, a question for you about, about that as well, didn't I? It was like, um, yeah. So, because you wrote this shape-shifting novel, right? Mist, and then there, there's characters who are actually part human and part animal, or at least sometimes human and sometimes animal. How do you work? How do you work animal characteristics in, into that? Do they do they retain their animal characteristics when they're in human form? Do they retain their human characteristics when they're in animal form? Um, well, there's obviously no right or wrong answer, and um, and there's different. Different stories have different um, have different ways of of doing that. Um, I well, I guess it I guess it really depends. It depends on maybe it depends most on whether they start out as a human and start turning into an animal, or the other way around. Mm -hmm. And because I feel like whatever they are initially kind of shapes how they see the world and what they're doing when they're an animal. Um, my favorite series as a kid was um, the Animorphs books, which were really fun because, um, because they, um, they involved shapeshifters and they involved kids who would um, turn into animals. And um, K.A. Applegate did a pretty good job of um, having them retain their sort of human consciousness and human ways of perceiving things while also starting to get into the um the animal instincts as well because they'd have the they'd have the senses of an animal but they'd also start to have the instincts of an animal too and so sometimes it was really really hard for them to to balance those two things and to keep keep themselves under control and um and there's one character who actually got um got stuck as a hawk <laughs> and then was trying to deal with being a, a human mind in a hawk body with hawk instincts and trying to not lose himself. And I think there's a lot of really great potential there to explore um, to explore the, um, concepts of identity. And um, and I feel like it's a very uh, a poignant theme of when your when your body doesn't match your your consciousness or whatever how it's emotionally very interesting to explore. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, Alpha Wolfio says, what about animals with more than one appendage, like four ears or two plus tails? Oh, you have a whole chapter in your book about movement and things, you could talk about that. <laughs> but I think, I, I'm not sure what, what the intention is, but I, maybe, maybe it's more than you would expect. So why would an animal have four ears? For instance, uh, so there are reasons for that uh, in my book. It's true, um, but I guess you've got to go back to to, to what, why they happen, right? So, so if you want to have an animal with with two tails or nine tails, um, you know, you're, uh, as in I'm plugging Amy's Amy's uh, uh, interactive story here. Um, you have to ask why they've got tails at all. Yeah. So if you if so. No, ears perhaps is an easier example. We have two, well, there's a lot of complicated reasons why we have two ears, but basically we have two ears because we're symmetrical down the middle. We're symmetrical down the middle because our little wormy-like ancestors found it easier to wriggle along the, the floor of the, of the sea if they were symmetrical, they had a left or right side and a front and a back. And because of all of that, we've got two ears. But you can imagine we could have four ears. Why would we have four ears? Well, if we really needed really good sound localization, you know, so owls are really good at localizing sound, but they've only got two ears. They're stuck with two ears because they also evolved from these little worms. So, so you could, so if you want to have an animal with four ears, 
that could make really great sense if if their if their niche is to is to find you know, little insect little rodents hidden in the snow or something like that. So I think if you if you want to do an animal, a realistic animal with unrealistic morphology with an unrealistic body, just ask yourself why do we have the things that we have, and then and then that that helps you to see what this animal would be doing with the with the extra one. But I mean, obviously, you can also always do things for fun because it's your writing and it's your world. So if you want two-headed ducks, that's fine. Ever since you said two-headed ducks, I now want to write a story about two-headed ducks, Eric. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, Gupin asks, any tips on how to research non-common animals? Which uncommon animals would you like to see better represented? Mm. Oh, I think that's similar to one of the questions I had for you. <laughs> yeah, I think I know what your answer is. Hmm. It's going to be well, hyenas. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, been there, done that. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, I'm always happy to see more hyena stories. And I feel like just in general, more, um, more animals that uh, haven't been represented as often or... Um, or are less known. I think um, they might be fun to explore. Um, I'm going to be starting graduate school here in a, maybe 24 hours or so, <laughs> less than that. And uh, and I'm going to be studying uh, rock hyraxes, uh, which uh, Eric has studied before as well. And um, they're adorable and fascinating. <laughs> their communication, especially, and so. Um, it would be neat to see more of them, but it would be neat to see more of more of everything. I feel like most especially animals that have been um, misrepresented in the media or or maybe or rarer animals, um, endang endangered animals, maybe <laughs> might get more people to um, to notice them and to care about them. Um, yeah. so. It's not easy to, 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 with with rare with uncommon animals. Um, that's that's for sure. But I think you'd be surprised how much naturalist writing there is on many species that, that you've never heard of. Um, yeah, you need to look around a little bit. You may need to search a little bit. Um, but there's a lot. I mean, you know, people have written have written either fictional stories or naturalist observations on just about just about everything, and, and, and some that are quite surprising. So I suppose that. The, the the unhelpful answer there is is just look around, but don't be don't be discouraged because people have written about just about everything. The the uncommon so one uncommon animal I'd really like someone to write about, yeah. And this ties into another question um, from Wolfgang Coyote. Any thoughts on non-human characters or species development that seem to have truly alien thoughts, feelings, and motivations? All right, here's my challenge. I want someone to write a story about electric fish, okay? Yeah. Because electric fish perceive the environment completely, completely differently from any other animal, right? They can't see a thing because it's all muddy water they live in. And they, they have these electric fields around their body. They generate an electric field from within their body and it surrounds them. And every time they swim past something, it sort of distorts the electric field a little bit and they pick that up and that's how they perceive the world. So we can't get into the, the head of how a bat sees the world through sonar. We certainly can't get into the head of an electric fish. So, so how you would do the, the, the character development so that we could still relate to them? I don't know. I'm trusting you guys. I mean, you know, come up, <laughs> come up with something, but I'd really love to see an electric fish story. Cool. Any other questions? Do you have any for me, Amy? I've asked you lots of questions. Oh, well, um, yeah, let's talk about aliens. <laughs> um, yeah, so in, in your book, you talk a lot about um, what uh, predictions we can or can't make about um, alien life elsewhere in the universe based on the processes of natural selection and evolution here on our planet. And um, it's a great book. Recommend it. <laughs> but... Um, but one thing I was curious about is uh, what's a, a misconception about um, alien life that's kind of widespread in popular culture that kind of bothers you the most? Mm -hmm. And what is it about mm -hmm. it that's so problematic? Yeah. 
So yeah. there is something. There is something that that it doesn't bother me. I mean, it, I actually really like reading sci-fi and reading a lot of this kind of sci-fi. Um, but it does make me think a lot. So my favorite science fiction of all time, right, is, is a book called The Black Cloud um, by Fred Hoyle, who was a very famous astronomer. I saw you reference that in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a yeah. fantastic hard sci-fi novel. It was written in the 1950s, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a little dated in, in some respects. It was really, really good. And it tells the, 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 the story of this um, intelligent cloud of gas, right, that floats around the universe. And it's, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, got, it's, it's very, very well written and, and it's very convincing. The only thing that is a real problem with it, and this, you, you get this a lot in sci-fi aliens, is that it's these, you have these hyper-intelligent aliens, right? For whom the purpose of being intelligent seems just to be an end in itself, right? They're intelligent because it's good to be intelligent. Yeah, this cloud floats around the universe philosophizing and, and trying to understand the universe. Why? Why did it get that way, right? Intelligence is like anything else. It evolves through natural selection. You are intelligent because you need to solve problems, right? Wolves are intelligent because they need to figure out how to take down a bison. So you get that you, intelligence arises through a process by which you need intelligence, and yet so many sci-fi aliens are just intelligent for the sake of it. So that's my little gripe. I mean, I, as I said, I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm not having a go at anyone. I think, I think they're great stories, but I think that's probably the, one of the unrealistic things that, that comes out a lot. Ooh. Well, on the, on the flip side of that, um, what's, uh, what's your favorite like alien species in popular culture or whatnot that, that you think is really cool for whatever reason or that you enjoy a lot, but it's just completely implausible from like a, <laughs> like a natural selection perspective or a physics perspective. Yeah. And what yeah. is it about it that makes it work for you, even though even though it doesn't work scientifically? Like what uh, what makes you suspend your disbelief? Yeah. So, so when you when you when you want to suspend your disbelief completely. Then it's got to be you, you know, it's got to be that's the point of the character. So I ask mm -hmm. you a question: Is Q from Star Trek, right? And and utterly unbelievable, right? Like completely impossible to to believe that, that, that this character, omnipotent character, could could possibly exist. But you notice he's in human form, right? So there's not even the pretense. Of, of oh this is some sort of alien creature that, that evolved or or exists on, on another planet for real he's a foil he's a foil for exploring all kinds of different ideas about about um, you know that that fantastic episode of next generation tapestry where he takes Picard back in time to allow him to live his life again differently is that you, you can explore those things using this ridiculous and impossible superpower but for that, he doesn't need to be a believable character. He doesn't need to be a believable animal. He doesn't need to be like a Borg or a, or, or a Dalek or, or, or anything else. But the, the, he's just, he, he, his superpower is him. That's, that would be, that's be why I say that. Like the Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love like Doctor Who so much. <laughs> more here. Um, and so, yeah, he often says there's a Next Generation episode that explains how there are so many variations of, of hu the humanoid body plan um, through the galaxy. And, and that's an interesting concept as well. It's also something that I, that I mention in, in my book. But you don't need to go to that. And this is kind of the point I'm making here. You don't need to go to this idea that, that some aliens have been going around dropping, um, you know, DNA on, on different planets around, around the universe. The reason that we look similar, the reason that we look similar to other animals, the reason that we do things similarly to other animals, is because we're doing the same things. And there are not that many different ways of doing it. There are not that many different ways of getting energy. You either get it from the sun, or you eat something that's got it from the sun, or you eat something that's eaten something that's got it from the sun. I mean, this is basically what it's going to be like all around, all around the universe, yeah. 
Any good animal-centric books you'd like to recommend? I've written down Watership Down, Private Life of Rabbit, Wild Animals I've Known, Rain of Wolf 21. <laughs> any, have you got any, any favorite ones, Amy? Hmm. Hmm. Through a Window, Through a Window by Jane Goodall. Very good, yeah. Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of good. I just I've read so many animal books. <laughs> there are, and I, and I and I I remember also when I was when I had just found the Private Life of the Rabbit, and I'd read it, and I was so impressed with it. And, and I remember going to a lecture, and it was about mouse behavior, I think. And the lecturer was telling me about a book about mouse behavior that sounded very much like the same book, right? So some mouse researcher had had written about about the sort of the emotional lives of, of mice. They, they, they seem to be everywhere. They seem to be about just about everything. Hmm. As a kid, one of my favorites was Julie of the Wolves by Jean Craighead George. Um, she was a really cool um, writer because she was also um, sort of a naturalist and would try to learn about the animals she was uh, discussing. So. Um, that's a cool book, kind of middle grade fiction, I think, but um, really nice. I I haven't read it in years, so I don't remember exactly how accurate it is to real wolf behavior, but I think book. she tried. Well worthwhile. Hmm? Going back to read your childhood books is well worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're kind of coming up to the end. Um, got a, a, a couple minutes yet left. Uh, anything you want to sum up? Um. I don't know, write about animals, write about all the animals, write about pangolins, write about everything. Just just write. <laughs> yeah, just write, but but write write about animals because because they're they are, they're really appealing and we can see ourselves in them a little bit. That's why furry exists. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.